Mark Hepp with CampgroundViews.com here in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. This is a special session of the Park Operators Information Group where we can teach you some tips about how to operate your parks better. We're in Myrtle Beach, as I mentioned, at Ocean Lakes Family Campground. The park has a unique history and I've got Barb Crum here. I'm going to quiz her on some things that might help you run your parks better. Thank you, Barb, for being here. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So can you go ahead and introduce yourself to people who don't know who Barb Crum is? Oh, sure. Um, I'm Barb Crum. Um, I started here in 1998 as the first marketing, marketing director for Ocean Lakes. And um, 20 years later, here I am. Um, I'm originally from Ohio, and I went to Columbus College of Art and Design in uh, Columbus, Ohio, and did graphic design and print media for many years, PR and event planning. And it kind of was the combination of skills that they needed uh, hands-on in this campground. So they needed, um, Ocean Lakes is unique, and obviously it's been um, ARVC's Park of the Year multiple times. Six times, yeah. So folks who may have heard of Ocean Lakes but don't really know, can you give them some background on what Ocean Lakes is and, and how it grew to become what it is? Yeah, um, it's an amazing park. It uh, is owned by the Jackson family. It sits on family land. Um, it was uh, Mary Emily Platt Jackson and her father um, here in, in Horry County. Uh, he owned a, a good bit of land in the area. He was a pharmacist in Conway and she inherited some of the family land and her and Mr. Jackson um, were married right after college. They had five daughters. He had promised her if she spent 30 years in the mountains with him, he was from Tryon, North Carolina in the textile industry. If, he's, if she spent 30 years in the mountains with him, uh, then he would spend 30 years at the beach with her. Oh, wow. And um, how we became a campground is an interesting story because he was a traveling salesman for cloth of gold fabrics in Tryon, North Carolina. It was a family business. So he grew up in a family business with his father and his grandfather. Meanwhile, Mrs. Jackson grew up in a family business with her father's being a pharmacist in Conway. So they both have roots in family business and the dynamics, as we all know as an operator, many of us are family campgrounds. Those of us are members of the family and those of us like me who are not members, but it still adds to that dynamic. Um, so when he uh, got out of college, he was uh, in the war, World War II stateside, and then after that he drove an old Trailways bus part-time. Eventually, fast forward, he's working in the family business. Um, he's going up and down the Eastern Corridor to sell cloth of gold fabrics, and he has six women to get out of bed in the morning. Mrs. Jackson would sew all the clothing for the five daughters wow. and herself, and they would model cloth of gold fabric. But traveling was a problem to all the department stores, so he actually converted an old Trailways bus. And this is actually how they discovered there really needed to be more family or more campgrounds in America. If you look back, this was probably in the late 50s that they were doing this, and there just weren't the campgrounds that you have today. Huh. So fast forward, her parents passed away in the 60s, and there was some um, getting things in order, and they broke ground at the end of the 60s and beginning of 1970, and uh, opened this campground in 1971, July 2nd, with 30 sites and one bathhouse. So 30 sites and one bathhouse in 1971. So when they launched the campground, well, let's go ahead and preview it. How many sites are there currently? Currently we have 859 traditional campsites and 2,566 what we call annually lease sites. But it might be a camper with an addition, it could be a mobile home, it could be um, a stick-built home. Let's don't, let's don't give it away, I want to I hold okay. that one back. So basically we have 3,500 sites. Mm -hmm. They started out with 31 and they've grown to 3,500, right? Correct. So that's a little bit of growth. Well, and when I started, obviously we were the size almost that we are now. Okay. And I would go to national conference and I didn't realize that we were this lumbering beast in the industry. And a lot of times operators will look at me or any of our team members and say, oh yeah, you know. And I'm like, you know what? We started with 30 sites and they were in their 50s when they started building. Really? Okay. Mm -hmm. So like a lot of park operators, they, they basically had a previous career and they went into this kind of as like a, a family retirement, yeah. let's, let's enjoy working together. So really it's kind of a similar story to a lot, of, a lot of folks. So at what point did they start scaling it up? Did they, from day one, did they have the vision of growing it to this or did something happen that got them to here? Um, Mr. Jackson thought big. He drew everything on napkins. 
Um, and he, um, to give you an example of how he thought, the recreation building is 17,000 square feet. And the family still jokes, it would be bigger if it wasn't next to the lake. <laughs> and if you go behind the rec building into teammate parking, you'll see there's barely enough space to get a car around the corner of the building. We're that <laughs> close to the lake. Okay. So he thought big. And really, I think the key focus for them was making guests happy and anticipating guest needs and um, catching early on trends that were happening. Hmm. They just had great instincts. He was the idea man, creativity, creativity. Um, he loved to be out there moving dirt. Um, he hated sitting in meetings. Um, she was, uh, she was really a brilliant businesswoman. She kept track, um, read the business sections of newspapers, kept track of finances, business trends and industry, world trends. So together they made a dynamic couple. Wow. Wow. And so um, sometimes I think she had to probably rein him in a little, but um, how we got so big was uh, the day they opened, um, they just opened the gate and people started pouring in. The two girls were younger working the gates. By the time they really got the park open, um, I think one girl was out of college, one, was, one or two were still in college, and two were still at home finishing school, high school or okay. beyond. And so they helped, um, they helped clean the bathhouses, helped work in the office, um, helped move dirt, helped haul dirt when, when it was being built. All of his five daughters, girls, pay attention, <laughs> um, they could move and drive huge trucks, wow. tractor trailer trucks and so, buses. So, so really, he never thought small. He just kept building and building. And as guests wanted to stay longer, he anticipated, well, maybe I need to have sites they can stay in year round or leave their camper here. Okay. And that's how it kept growing. And that's where the seasonal sites. So this is resonating with a lot of people because that's basically park operator story right there right it is. they just start working and and, and, I'm, and i'm seeing so many people that are just like this right, and so right. now they're saying okay 31 sites to 3500 sites and what are you talking about seasonal sites so now let's, let's go into that a little bit because if, if and we'll show you some shots of yeah. the seasonal sites that are out there and and you're gonna go yeah right it looks like no campground that exists anywhere else so yeah. now where we are today he had this idea people want to stay longer so he creates the annual, annual sites how does that take off then or how does that start building to where we are today for the annual sites well, um, it goes to those people who uh, used to camp. Most of our leaseholders, many, many of them have camped at one point. And they just got tired of pulling the camper back and forth. Um, they wanted to get to the beach faster, um, or they wanted to just leave their camper. Maybe they didn't have a place at home they could park it. So eventually, he just started creating section by section um, the, the lease sites. The south side is probably our oldest area besides some of the main camping areas. Um, and he continued to let them build. Um, there have been some things that have influenced the look of the houses. Um, one of the biggest things that happened was Hurricane Hugo. Okay. And when was this? That would have been September 1989 okay. prior to to me getting here. But it really changed everything. Hugo devastated Myrtle Beach, it devastated the park. So it was easy to clear campsites from the, you know, the transient campers, but when you have sites that maybe were campers that had decks built around them, or at that time we'd already evolved into some stick-built homes okay. or some mobile homes that maybe had structures attached. Um, in Horry County, um, and we are, Horry County, just for those of to give you an idea, we border North Carolina to our far north. Okay. And then our, so we're the top eastern corner of South Carolina, right up against the North Carolina border. Um, so storms are, are a big issue here. So there's, there's definitely um, flood plain issues that the county uh, sets. But at that time when Hugo hit, we couldn't they couldn't have known what would happen. And right. it took all the sites down there on the oceanfront and just stirred them into a big pot. Wow. So at that point, obviously, the county had to react. The floodplains were changing. Um, and also, as a campground operator, you had to anticipate this issue and work with the county. We work very closely with our local officials, obviously. Um, and really, the campgrounds in Myrtle Beach, and there's several mega parks here, have worked together and also all been very successful. And so we have, you know, 
because of the people that we bring to the, the Grand Strand, they get used to some of our ideas and work. You know, the park operators have to work very closely with county officials and city officials to try and get things done. Mr. Jackson um, slowly evolved his operation to work with the floodplain issues. Everything had to be elevated, road ready. Um, What's road ready mean? Meaning you could pull it out during a okay. storm. But once Hugo happened, it changed some things and they were able to build houses up on pilings. So I, before 1989, I'm picturing the park view before and then there was a lot of park models that were kind of on the yeah. ground. So that was a lot of the, So what we're seeing today is basically post-1989. for A, a lot, lot of, of it is. Okay. There were a few, um, and actually I think it was one of the family homes that was kind of up on pilings. But most of what you see now really started changing after Hugo. So you see these huge stick-built homes. Um, we allow 1,600 square feet of heated living space. Okay. Basically a two-story home with 800 square feet per story, but on pilings you have basically kind of three stories. Right. So you park under them. So that allowed the park to build a structure to the maximum footprint of the site. Um, we always own the land. We don't ever deed the land. Um, I kind of describe it as a mobile home on steroids or mobile home park on steroids. <laughs> um, it's definitely um, it's a, it's a curious thing to a banker, um, but. Anyone that's dealt with any of us knows, you know, this is how it is. There's, they own the structure, we own the land. Um, the value of resale of their house or their park model or whatever, if it's not mobile, obviously that owner probably has a mortgage on that structure. And then the value of the resale is also that lease right, really. So when we were developing, and I was here as we developed some of our very last free space, mm -hmm. we are very, very developed. Um, we have 310 oceanfront acres, about just under a mile of oceanfront. Wow. So it's a lot of oceanfront property. Um, obviously, you couldn't really find that kind of property today. Um, and, and like I said, there's several mega parks that are oceanfront. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a unique thing yeah. in our industry. Well, actually, let's talk about this. So, you know, as you mentioned, you're not going to find oceanfront anymore, right? But there's a lot of parks that are developing in places where it might not be an ocean, but it's a lake or, right. or it's ATV riding right. or, you know, it's something that's unique to that park. Right. And one of the things I notice about ocean lakes, it, it's even in the name, it's ocean lakes. And the, the lakes mm -hmm. is kind of like the, what you key in on. There's these lakes inside of here. So, you know, folks are like, oh, I don't have oceanfront. I can't build that. But the reality is um, the ocean is almost... When you're inside the park, the ocean's there, but it's almost like secondary to what you built inside the park. So can you talk a little bit about that? How you, and I guess this goes to what you're saying about them forecasting what people are wanting, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. as a park operator looking at this, how would they kind of build something similar in their area that maybe they're playing on the ocean or the ATV or the lake, but then they build something unique that draws people in? Well, I think, I think the number one thing you have to pay attention to, and, and it, it doesn't matter what amenity you add, you know, first, what is the number one thing that draws people to you? Is it that location? Is it the lake? You know, for us, really, no matter what we, the millions and millions of dollars we invest back into this company, you know, really that ocean is our number one amenity. Okay. So, you know, from there, then there's all the pluses and the bonuses that make us more competitive here because we sit next to our biggest competitors right next door, mm -hmm. you know, and we admire one another. We're very competitive. <laughs> we actually co-op together as a destination. Six of the campgrounds actually assess ourselves money to market Myrtle Beach as a camping mecca. Wow, that's big. It is big. It's, yeah. it's, it's a guarded camaraderie, but, you know, it's something that the founders of all these campgrounds, they just had... They had wisdom to do it that They recognized way. that there was a big enough pie that if they grew that whole pie, Correct. they're all going to yeah. be good. Yeah, okay. and it worked together. Now, don't get me wrong. We compete very stiffly to get them to our <laughs> campground. But the neat thing is, even when we do travel shows together, each campground, and I'm telling you this for a reason, because each of the campgrounds that belong to this association are different. Um, there is three that, four that are oceanfront. Um, one that is in the city limits, about six blocks from the ocean, and one that's inland, probably 40, 50 minutes from here, that is a newer park okay. that sits on a lake in a more wooded area. Obviously, they have more space. They're not right. so developed. 
And so together we market this destination because sometimes it's not what's in your park. It's what you're adjacent to okay. or in, you know, are you in the mountains? Are you near Biltmore Estates or are you in California, you know, up in the Sierra Nevadas or are you in yeah. Colorado near Peaks? Yep. You know, Pikes Peak. There's so many beautiful places in the country. Yep. So number one, kind of where you are, but what, why are people coming to you? And I think that was really one of the things that the Jackson family continues to keep close to their heart. Now that the founders have passed away, both of them passed in 2010, the five daughters have been at the helm for really the 20 years I've been here. Wow. And it's run like if a business first family business. You know, you can do business first or family first. Ours is a business first. So there's a board of directors and a family council. So the family meets and then the board and they elect to the board. And mm. that helps keep your business run more like a business so that the family guides the ship. The family has input. The family obviously knows what they want to do with their business, but they have the professionals guiding them. So you might have outside board of directors. Mm. You've got your hired management. But truly, it is the family business, the shareholders yeah. that really are, are responsible and their family. Um, and so as you continue to build your, your campground, um, one, what does that mean? It might be your location on the highway or it might be your location near you know, a racetrack or near an ATV or a, yeah. a horseback yeah. riding or whatever that location might be. Sometimes it's just convenience. You know, in the Carolinas, we have a lot of campgrounds in North and South Carolina, and I sit on the, the state board, um, Carvic, and it's a great resource because you learn. I don't care what size you are, you learn from each other. We all deal with the same issues oftentimes. Maybe some of them are on our smaller scale or a bigger scale, but truly we're in this together and our industry shares a lot of common things. So I have one owner that sits right on the highway and he knows his, his big thing is the college games. Hmm. You know, and I, I've talked to other board members that have the same thing. So I think yeah. one, knowing what draws and then two, adding those amenities, what your guests want. And, and every demographic is different. Okay, that's, that's a great dovetail. So then Let's um, talk a little bit about your specific role. And so now as a park operators, they may be doing everything themselves, right? Right. They, you're marketing, right? Right. You're director of marketing. Right. And so you handle the marketing for Ocean Lake. So let's talk about the marketing aspect of, mm -hmm. of how you get people both into, engaged with, and coming back to your park. Hmm. So, I mean, essentially that's your role, right? It is. And so from a marketing perspective, what do, what do you see the... What, what are the current things that really work, and where do you th see things going in the future for marketing RV parks mm -hmm. and campgrounds? Um, I would say, other than what we just talked about, your location, customer service. If you don't have friendly customer service and great, we call them teammates, but if you don't have a good staff, you're wasting your money. And I joke with salespeople because there are a ton of them that call on me. I'm sure everyone watching, too. Um, you can spend all the money you want, but if you can't provide friendly customer service and you cannot be open to your guests, then you're wasting your money on all the marketing that you're doing. Wow. You need to stick to some of the basics. And believe it or not, I'll tell a lot of our salespeople, you'd be surprised what we don't spend on marketing. You know, the philosophy of this company is really about a team. Uh, we are a team style management. We all, it doesn't matter what your position, CEO or VP or whatever your position here is, we just have first names because we see ourselves as teams. We're not above doing whatever it is that needs to be done because let's keep our eyes focused on the mission. And the motion, the mission, and one of the, the best cost um, savings on marketing is repeat guests. So probably 80% or more of our guests are repeat. Wow. Word of mouth. And if you don't make them happy, if you don't provide outstanding service You're and, in trouble. and friendly service, and if you don't clean that bathhouse and you don't clean your offices or your cabins well, or you don't keep your sites well maintained, what's the point? There's too many choices out there. Yeah. So you really need yeah. to think of marketing a little broader than advertising, first off. And I love that our company thinks that way. I have the best team hands down i would argue with anybody we got a rocking team here and i we're family um and to give you an idea is creating a place that people want to work that's another key marketing thing market internally to your team first mm -hmm. so um, i told you that our average teammate has been here 15 years 
and the average age is 45. We have about 200 teammates year round. Wow. We'll swell to over 500 in season because we'll have 30, 35,000 guests in park on an average Repeat that day. for me. Repeat that one for me. Yeah. Nobody believes me when I tell them. Yeah, How many so people are here in the In the, the summertime, we're busy. When I started, we used to say 20,000, <laughs> but we were still elevating homes. And if you have homes, think about it. If you have what can sleep in a camper is, you know, anywhere from one person to right. maybe eight yeah. average, but probably average is five, six people in the summertime. And then the houses will sleep anywhere from four to 20, 20 guests. Wow. The house has changed everything. And we can go back to some of the operational changes that happen that way. Um, just from demand of a guest, you know, so wait, trash before we go to that, 35,000 when you add those numbers up, I would say in season, we're in that 20, 25,000. But when you hit July, we're in 30, 35,000. So, okay. So 35,000 people on site yeah. and we're talking about customer service and making 35,000 because the, the problem you have and correct me if I'm mm -hmm. wrong, 35,000 people, it only takes 1% of them to be pissed off and go on to Google or Yelp or something like that and trash your reputation. So it becomes real, from a marketing perspective, how do you communicate, how do you, how do you measure that? How do you keep that going and, and have good customer service to 35,000 people? Well, you know, in 20 years, marketing's changed a lot, I can tell you. Social media has changed my life <laughs> dramatically and my family's life. Um, you can't turn it off. I didn't ask for it. Does it work great for us? Oh, Facebook rocks. You know, I think we're at 120,000 plus fans or likes, whatever wow. you want to call them. And we work it night and day. We babysit that thing. But we didn't ask for TripAdvisor or Google reviews or, you know, RV park reviews or whatever. We didn't ask for those things. They just happen and they continue to happen. And it is a lot to maintain. Now, obviously, I just told you how big our team is. Yes. You know, but we're a big park. And I know because I grew up in a family business that was small. My husband is a family business and he's a one person and, and running the whole show and everything. So, you know, managing all that is really hard. Um, you got to do your best. I had one uh, owner and it's just him and he owns a, a small park, but he does a great job. And one time he was like, Barb, I just don't want to respond to these reviews. They're just not wrong. They're not right. They're mean. They're saying bad things. And I just get so ticked off when I read it. I don't even want to look at it. Yeah. And I was like, Mike, that's one of your best marketing opportunities. It's one of your best public relations opportunities. Hmm. You know, I think if you've ever convinced an unhappy customer, um, they can become your best advocate. Wow, so let's go into that a little bit more. So what would be a tactic that other park owners could use? They've got, a, they've got this nasty review that, that just pisses them off because it's wrong. How would you respond to that? How would you, how would you address that? How do you, how do you change that person? <laughs> um, sometimes you can't. Okay. I think you have to say that first. I think there's a couple. So I will describe how I handle it. And, okay. and my team, which is now, I actually was um, a one-person department and then I became a two-person department um, because we do a lot of printing and graphic design in-house. And then with social media, um, recently, about a year, year and a half ago, I became a three-person department. And it really was social media that required that. So when you get angry, it's okay. Get angry. Sometimes it's best to sleep on it. You know, they've posted it. it, it whatever it's on, whatever site it's on, TripAdvisor, Google, Facebook, whatever. Um, I will tell you the ones that you can remove them from, I rarely do that. Oh, really? Yeah. If it's a one star, and you can go on. I mean, you can go on and sort by one star, and you can find yeah. our reviews. There's some really awful reviews on there, you know, and, and that goes to PR, and we can talk a little bit about some of the public relations side of this, but really, um, I am like a detective. I used to love the Hardy Boys and mm. Nancy Drew, and um, I, love I still love stuff, Columbo yeah. <laughs> and, you know, CSI and all those kinds of things. So... With, with our team, we're big, where you might be more hands-on, this operator that's watching, they know everything. They right. know the guest that's doing it, they handled the situation, or they saw it happen. With me, we're a big park, right. so I immediately, um, a whole chain of emails. I, I like the security manager, the really? main office, the supervisor, whoever that complaint in, is about, yeah. they get looped in and I do my research. What happened? Really? I send them okay. the review and I say, what what? This is what's being said. What can you tell me? And I spend a lot of time, and my team does, saying, 
to my team because we are a family. Yeah. I'm not, when I send that, I had a new guy start and he's got a pretty big area. And I, I, I think he kind of was taken aback a little bit that I sent this complaint about the pool. Ah. And I was like, I am not, I'm on your side. No, I got your back. So let your team know. I mean, now if they mess up, you call them on it. Right. But you want to do that research and find out what really happened because here's why. Sometimes it's really, the first thing you need to realize is those who read the bad review, your response can tell the other side of the story. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's your opportunity. This is what I told Mike. Okay. This is Mike. A lot of them you can't respond. Now, Facebook, they can respond back and forth to you, but TripAdvisor and some of those others, they put the review, you respond. Right. Remember the, the tool that you're using. So I respond to bad reviews on Facebook different than I do TripAdvisor mm. or Google. And it becomes an art. It, it becomes a challenge. It, it, it gets a little maddening, but if you do it the right way, I've actually had many reviews pulled down. By the user themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because they lie. And this is your chance to tell your side. The other thing is, own up to it. If you messed up, own it. Yeah. You know, I am sorry. We obviously failed to meet your expectations. Always have a voice of empathy and professionalism and concern, but sternly state the facts. Okay, so in our park, we're big. I'll tell you, one of the biggest issues that all the big parks have is people's behavior. People yeah, you can't just, police 35,000 people. We're not your babysitter. You know, <laughs> we are not the disciplinarian here for you. We are not the parent. Um, and I'm talking about the 50-year-olds are bad as the, <laughs> the 16-year-olds. You know, um, we have golf car rentals. We have a fleet of 900 plus golf cars that they can rent, and we allow them to bring their own electric golf cart. That is one of the advantages. It's one of the reasons they choose us. If you have an electric golf car, you show the insurance, you sign the zero tolerance paperwork and five <laughs> times that says you must be 16 with a valid driver's license. And not drunk. It's on the steering wheel. <laughs> no, no, you know, we don't even, we don't even sell alcohol on the premises. Wow. We figure you'll find it. You're welcome to drink it at your site. You know, but you know how people are. Yeah. Their behavior yeah. has changed. I say it's too much reality television. I don't know what it is. But, you know, um, it's your opportunity to address things like this and plant seeds in people that are reading the response. So a lot of times I'm not even, there are some you can just, they're not even going to, you're not going to change their mind. You're not going to make them happy. So just, do you respond to those? or do I you respond leave them? to, I respond to all the bad ones that I absolutely can. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes you know, they're, they're popping through my emails. Mondays are horrible. I okay. mean, they're just flooding through. But I check them throughout the weekend yeah. and everything. I'll tell you, last Saturday, I responded to two of them right there after breakfast. I was so mad. Uh-oh. My husband Wait, you like, didn't oh. listen to your own advice, though. You didn't sit on well, it. Well, I mean, I knew what to say. <laughs> okay. You know, right, you're right. like, okay, this is just not right. So you've got, so in those cases where you're not going to get through to them, you've got an idea. Your response, you're not responding to them. You're responding to the person who's read that review and they're going to read. So in fact, that. last Saturday, I actually put that in there because for the first time ever, I had somebody quote and they didn't do it accurately. My standard, like I keep copies of standard responses. I don't, I don't really copy and paste, but I'll use phrases. Okay. Yeah. And so this person had put phrases in there. They just weren't happy. And it was very clear that I don't think they'll ever be back. And, that, and, I, and I said that, be honest. Listen. I am sorry we failed to meet your expectations. And by your review, I can tell, and this was on TripAdvisor, by your review, I can tell that anything that I say, you know, you're, you're probably not going to be happy with. So for those who are reading this review and the response, mm. here's the, and I actually put in there, I said, here's the honest, hard, no frills truth wow. about what you went through. And it really... The number one complaint we have today, it used to be people that didn't clean up after their dog when I started, but now it's about people's behavior. It's the biggest amount of complaints we get aren't about our operation. It's about the other guest behavior. Hmm. And, and it's frustrating. And yeah, there's nothing you can do about that. Well, we spend a lot of money and time on security. But there's nothing, I mean, you can't go out, you can't police everybody here. So, I mean, so from a, from a park operator's perspective, you, I mean, the best you can do is respond to that. Say, you know, say. There's a few more Thank things you. that we, you can we do. We appreciate yeah. that. We'll we'll take that in a mm -hmm. note. Um, yeah, the person's crazy at the pool. We'll increase 
observation of the pool. I mean, you can respond right. directly to those type of you things. You need to know what tactics you have in place to deal with that. And that's the one thing. What do you have in place to address it? It may not be enough, but let them know. So one lady um, sent an email to us about our Wi-Fi and wanted to know why she didn't have 300 um, megabits <laughs> per second like she has at home. Um, why not? And I explained to her, gee, I actually asked our IT guy, George, and I'm like, George, I only have 100 megabits and I just upgraded. I, that's at my house. I'm like, who has 300? I don't know where she lives. Maybe that's standard in somewhere. But, you know, you just have to be honest with people. And that's really the key. And yeah. be human and be respectful. But sometimes you just got to say the facts. And I think at the end of that reply, I said something like, you know, her... We would do whatever we can to help our guests' needs within reason. Within the reason. Yeah. That's great. So let's, let's dovetail now on to um, some of the marketing you do. And, and one of the things that's unique about Ocean Lakes, and you don't see this a lot of campgrounds, is you have a mascot. And you use this mascot in all of your marketing. And, and there's been some discussion recently with some park operators about mascots and about branding and about mm -hmm. that type of stuff. So um, your character is Sandy. He's a He's starfish. He's a starfish. And, yeah. um, it started out as just part of the logo and you've kind of adapted it to where it's, it's, it's kind of a mascot. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about that and do people recognize it when they come in here now that they know who Sandy is? I do. He actually was a piece of artwork on a newsletter, hmm. which he's up here on the wall. We have our history section. Okay. Yeah, and you can see how he appeared and then he evolved into our mascot when we did some um, team, team things and branding and uh, service mark, slogan, that kind of thing. And so Sandy has evolved. There were three versions, and the first thing I did in 98 was look at my boss, Lance Thompson, who's our vice president and general manager, and say, can I Disneyize him? We love Disney. I'm sorry. They're the best. Right? <laughs> and I saw that he could embody all the things that Ocean Lakes has to offer. I didn't realize at the time, and I don't think anybody did, how hard it is to become with a starfish mascot costume. They're very awkward to design huh. for because they're a star and you, would you have legs coming out of it? I don't know. It's, it's just all. But other than that, we probably have 100 plus versions of Sandy. You know, he does everything. He does the hula and he prays for church and he does Camp Starfish and he does our teammate values and he takes photos and he um, fishes and he does texting and um, bluegrass, he plays the banjo. He uh, knows how to shag dance, which is beach and, you know, the, not the, the so American. He does the everything. Jitterbug, yeah, he, he does can do everything. It. Um, he did square dance. We actually, I think, had him in a dress one time. And he's really, we don't know if he's a boy or a girl, okay. truly. Um, our naturalist might be able to answer that about starfish. I don't know. <laughs> but anyhow, we have a lot of fun with Sandy. And so I told you, um, people have come to love him. One of the, the most fun things that we did um, was tattoos for kids. Mr. Jackson um, and Mrs. Jackson, our founders, live in the campground. They have a house adjacent here. And they also had an, an old, um, a Class A motor home that they would park on their site, HH53, the oh. first concrete pad we had. And he would sit out there and hand out tattoos to all the kids and visit with them. Oh, wow. And so here I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, I am throwing away a lot of money on these little tattoos oh, that we're no. just handing out, you know. <laughs> but he loved them, and people love them. So, you know, we do a lot of tattoos and give those away. Yeah. And um, last week we actually, um, my former assistant texted me a photo of Good Morning America. And um, what I love is how our team thinks, because a couple years ago, one of our maintenance guys, our carpenters, saw these giant Adirondack chairs somewhere, and he's like, we need those for the beach. And so he built them. Okay. And then we put our mascot on the chairs, and they become, we have a couple areas we all do in our parks, right, that people could take photos. If you don't, you selfies, need to. These are selfie locations, right? Yeah, and you need to have that with your logo. It's great branding because our chairs showed up on Good Morning America. What? A man lost 100 pounds. And they were doing his story. So he had all his before and afters. And then he had a picture of him and his wife sitting in our giant chairs with Sandy there on oh the chair. Oh, my gosh. And, of course, we put it on Facebook. And, and people are like, oh, my gosh, we saw that. We knew it was Ocean Lakes, Ocean Lakes. And he's coming back and stuff. Wow. But, you know, people, you could tell. You guys, and they were commenting. You branded it. You branded We know Sandy Starfish, you know. And so that's really. That's huge. Yeah. And you don't have to be huge to do that. No, you don't. You just have to be consistent. You have to kind of have, uh, well, some very funny conversations about how starfish stand and eat. And um, <laughs> as you know, but it sounds like what you have colors fun with their it. mouth. Yeah. And we have fun. Yeah. Have fun with it. That's yeah. some of the things about business that are much more fun than responding to online reviews. Yeah.
Yeah. Well, that's very cool. Okay, so I can keep asking questions all day, so I'm not going to do that because we got, we'll run out of tape. But um, these park operators, I hope they've learned, they've learned about social media, they've learned about branding, and, and a bit of about the marketing. If there's one last thing you could leave them with, where they're, I mean, Ocean Lakes is basically epic in the industry. What, what tip could you leave them that they can walk away from this, this video and say, I'm going to apply that today? I would say um, one of the most important things to protect your business is um, know the laws, especially when it comes to like human resources. Okay. Don't mess around with that. You could, let's face it, night and day, you've invested maybe your life savings in this park. Your family's life might be in this park. And it only takes one person with liability to ruin your park. Mm -hmm. So one of the best things that you can do from uh, a guest standpoint and a human resources personnel standpoint, if you have any employees, or just to protect yourself, is make sure you seek advice on these things. We toured a park the board did last, last week up in North Carolina. It was a great park. I love the owner. Um, <laughs> and they were going through a master plan. So she had a three-phase plan. We do master planning every so often, every decade or two, and we phase our plans in. So you have to have a business plan, and you have to be aware of where your liability is for, so the guests won't sue you. And you also want to be legal from an employee standpoint. Okay. So I would say there are some great resources. And networking with your peers in your industry, and the reason I brought up that park, we say, she said, you know, we took this over in February 2016, and okay. we were sitting in the office, and I looked at my husband, and I said, certainly we shouldn't have to recreate the wheel. Yeah. Certainly somebody has gone through and faced all these issues before, and she found her state association. Boom. And through the state, you find national. And so there's a website at rvic.org that has a ton of resources on forms, professionals, you know, uh, insurance companies, have them walk through. Think of yourself as a safety committee. We actually have a oh, teammate wow, okay. safety committee that meet um, and they go through the campground and um, that's really important. And to do that, so that's actually, that actually sounds like a really something they could actually do. So if they, if they hit end on this video, write down safety committee. And they can call up their insurance agent and say, hey, we're, we're forming a safety committee. Can you send somebody out to walk through our property? Would, right. their, their carrier would be willing to do that. You can not? also hire OSHA experts, freelance. Okay. You know, we'll have OSHA people come through and walk through and kind of do a study. Um, I know Levitt Insurance, which is one of the industry partners, yeah. you can get them to come out. You want somebody who specializes in campgrounds because okay. we are different. Okay, so they're going to understand that. And so you want that expert on that. And then you also, you know, um, Arvik has some great resources for uh, human resources. Like if you have work campers, there's a lot of things you need to be aware of and know about these things that from, a, from an investment standpoint, you would be frustrated if something happened to your big investment because of something like that. Yeah, that makes a lot so of And there's so much on your plate, Yeah. you know. Um, and I will tell you even guest feedback. Sometimes if you pay attention to what guests tell you and we make, they can fill out a survey, they can go online um, and fill out a survey, they can email us, be accessible and, and read it and make your team aware. So, you know, um, the minutes from our safety committee meeting are circulated to all the departments. Wow. Um, we post our, uh, we have a magazine that has a comment card in the back. Those are literally typed up every month and they are posted the good, the bad, and the ugly. And if it's got a name in it that isn't so good, you know, a teammate kind of got, did something maybe not so well, we take that name out, obviously. You don't want to crush anyone. Right. As my son would say, you don't want to crush their love. <laughs> but, um, but you do want people to see, you want your team to see the feedback. Wow. And so I That's will cool. oftentimes send bad reviews to a team um, and my response. So they can see that you I got their back. Through. And you, yeah, I yeah, see that. Yeah, and I tell them that I'm not out, I'm on your team. Yeah. And 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 I'm gonna this is how I answered that response. But I also will I have a talking point, so I have like this fast email list and I will like morale builders, especially in season, I'll take mm. all those great reviews and I'll pick some of the best ones and mm. I'll send them out to the talking points list and, and encourage the managers and the supervisors and the key frontline people who are on that list to share them with their team. Wow, Barb, this has been awesome. Mm -hmm. I hope you've learned a bunch from this. If you enjoyed it, go ahead and leave a comment down below. 
click that like button, and definitely share this video with other park operators. And if you've got a story, reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. I'm Mark Hepp with campgroundviews.com. Thank you and goodbye.